Hello, Next I'm Hungry. It's Chris Dancy, and I'm so excited to be joining you today for this keynote on techno valueism. What is techno valueism? Where we're going to explore that and a whole lot more. But first, I have to make myself a little smaller and get out of the way so I can share my presentation with you. Are you ready? I'm going to shrink. Here we go. Hey, it's me. I'm down here in the corner. Just a little smaller, but still here with you. So today we're talking about techno valueism or creating an interface to your values, beliefs, and spirituality with technology. This is kind of out there, so brace yourself, but I think you're already doing it anyway. If you go to Google right now, put in two words, most connected, my name and picture will come right up. I did a TED talk in 2014, but since then there have been four or five different TED talks that mentioned me. I've been on the cover of Business Week. I had a show on cable, which moved to Netflix back in 2017 called Darknet. I have a book in bookstores that you can get from my website now called Don't Unplug, How Technology Saved My Life and Can Save Yours Too. And I've done work for some of the biggest companies all over the world to help them think about technology differently. But what does that have to do with techno valueism? Well, I would say that today's values are actually technology based. Well, yes, we're all human and yes, we all have very human desires and dreams and ambitions. The reality is technology is influencing how we choose to care for each other and the world around us. And I think it's important we talk about this a little bit more because over the last 50 years, technology has radically transformed. From 1990 to 2020, technology was all about being personal or taking care of maybe the upper end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But now, since 2020, for a variety of factors, the technology Maslow hierarchy pyramid has flipped, and most of the technology used today goes towards solving big problems, problems that affect all of us. Think about it. When you go to say hello or thank you, there's so many ways. Instead of just celebrating birthdays, many people have fundraisers on Facebook. If you buy something online, you usually can round up or donate to your favorite charity. Even when we remote order food here in the United States, we often have an opportunity to increase the amount of our purchase to go to a special cause. And of course, there are millions of online charities and platforms. A very value-based subject such as giving has been turned into a technology transaction. But what about complex issues, issues that have been around for a long time, like LGBTQIA? Well, think about it. There isn't a company out there in the, in the world that doesn't somehow try to embrace Pride Month. Apps like TripIt that help people travel and travel safely now give you a safety score for certain marginalized groups within the application to let you know where you're going to stay. And more importantly, rideshare apps like Lyft and Uber now allow you to choose pronouns. And mental health, something we don't talk a whole lot about but should talk about more, is embedded in almost everything we do, from Apple controlling how often we use our devices along with Google, to applications like Twitter and Facebook that have special routines in them that help people look for and get help when their friends think they might need it because of different mental health challenges. Or, I love the country of Sweden, they actually have a partnership with Twitter where they allow people to actually send a message to that person saying, hey, do you want to talk with someone? Almost a proactive approach. Climate, we're seeing so much of this now. Again, lift at the forefront by allowing people to choose carbon neutral cars. Or Snapchat, which has filters to help young people visualize the effects of climate change in their environments in their neighborhoods or Facebook that allows people to check in on disasters. They've been doing this for nearly a decade. Companies like Airbnb, which during disasters here in the United States in the last part of the last five years have allowed people to donate their homes so people have a place to stay. But in countries like the America, we have problems that are really tough like gun violence. So again, technology technological solutions that align to our values have sprung up from changing your profile photo to having special days on social media to even playlists geared at people who've suffered through gun violence in communities that have been affected by it on applications like Spotify or democracy. Things as important as how to vote and where to vote 
here in the United States, once again, technology is embedded into our voting systems, not at the voting machines or ballot boxes, but when you go to your favorite social media sites, such as Reddit, on election day, they tell you where to vote instead of letting you in the application. Twitter does the same thing. Facebook encourages you to go out and share your uh, polling places. And of course, even Spotify has playlists for election day. Complex, ugly, horrible issues like racism, where companies now are banding together to create DEI initiatives. Applications like mobile justice allow people to carry this and automatically opens up their camera and starts filming. And even Yelp has got in to the uh, action by allowing consumers to actually list and call out businesses they think that are involved in discrimination. Radically different. These are all ways that we're expressing our values through our technology. But even current issues like the things going on in Europe and Ukraine, again, Airbnb, People are getting participatory. So instead of Airbnb coming up with an open housing plan, they're allowing people to rent out empty Airbnbs, even though no one will be there just to get money to Ukraine. Over on Product Hunt, there are hundreds, thousands of applications that are being created every single day to help folks. And in the news, people are participating and putting their comments about what's going on at the very top. Everything is starting to grease our actual relationship to our values and technology. But it's more than just the technology, it's how we use it. I like to call this the hypertextuals. Think about something as simple as emoji. Whereas once they looked like actual guns, today they look like more toy guns. Whereas once the syringe in emoji looked like something drawing blood, today it looks like something drawing a vaccine. And once we used to have men and women, we now have gender neutral figures, some of them even pregnant. So our ability to show our, our values through our technology is all over and it's constantly evolving. See, I think we are becoming more inclusive, more supportive, more empathetic because of technology, not in spite of it. Whereas many people think technology is polarizing us, I think it has a way of accelerating our values. But what about me? Where did I get these views and where did they come from? So let's look at some ancient Christory. Haha, ha, get it, Christory. <laughs> Uh, in 2008, I had turned 40 years old. I was on two different heart medications, multiple antidepressants. I was 120 pounds heavier than I am now. I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. I'd been to jail, rehab, and everything else. I was a mess. But something happened to me. I thought to myself, why does my technology know so much about me and I know so little about myself? So I started looking at all the different devices I spent time in, my pager, my cell phone, it wasn't very smart then, my video camera, my laptops and desktops, and I thought, how do I extract all the information about me from these systems and start to identify the patterns of my values? And slowly but surely, that's exactly what I did. And I threw all of these things in the buckets. Think about all the ways your technology understands you, all the statistics it shares about you. Slowly between 2008 and the end of that decade, 2010, my Google Calendar, which became the repository for every single piece of data I created, filled up. Now, I didn't do this manually. I created little scripts and programs so my Google Calendar would be color-coded so I could see my entire day. But more importantly, I could search for important moments. Suddenly this data visualization led me to wild understandings about when I was maybe less than pleasant on social media and how sometimes I was more performative for my friends. I would only do things if I was drinking because they liked that. Or if I binged watch television, how little I got done in my day-to-day -day life. Or how when I was not so pleasant on customer service sites, I was usually not so pleasant in real life. I did all sorts of fun things with that data. I even created a routine where if I would come home and head to the bar, my phone would start a countdown, and the minute I sit at the bar too long, it would automatically tell me to get out of the bar, it would then tell the bartender to cut me off, and it would then tell my friends to come get me and send them pictures from my picture roll. So I was an early adopter of having my phone tell me how to behave, but I wanted to try to understand and control my behavior better. Slowly but surely, as I poured myself out of my phone and examined it, I realized that a majority of my problems were my values were misaligned to my phone. Sounds mind-blowing, but it's not. See, if you think about it, so much of what you do every day is in your phone, and those applications and how you use them actually fulfill who you are as values. 
simple, wild things like using Google Glass in 2014 to automatically tell me to shop less if I was spending too much money at the mall, or if I was in an office meeting and I was talking too loud, like through a conference call, something we all do so often today, my phone would actually pay attention and then tell the lights on my house to dim, reminding me and not alerting anyone online to get a little quiet. Slowly but surely, my life filled with data and more and more ways I was able to understand what I valued and what I did. Was that it? Well, I'm gonna take a break on my story and come to your story. Think about how today's behaviors are technology-centered. Everywhere around you, for the last 50 years, technology has gotten closer and closer, will be starting to surround you more and more. Some days it's hard to tell where you stop and the technology begins. And your life has become automated. So many things that you take for granted, whether it's activity, nutrition, rest, focus, or what you do for work are all influenced and mediated by the technology you use. So many of us get reminders to be active from our devices. So many of us will take times to get healthy and log what we eat and how we eat and when we eat through the devices. Or when we go to sleep, our devices help us set alarms, set up routines to wake up, even routines to slow the house down so that we can actually fall asleep gently at night. Or focus. There are so many applications today that help us retain and manage our focus. And this is something we don't often talk about. We are technologically assisted. We're basically cyborgs. What about our minds? I can't tell you how many pieces of technology are constantly asking me to relax or calm down. See, just 10 years ago when I was doing this to myself, I was an outlier. But today, every single one of you is actually participating in this. What about how we get work done? Today, my email actually reminds me to set aside time for myself and when I forget to email someone back, I get an email from my email telling me, did you mean to call someone back? Very big mother, not so big brother. Or our families, whether it's the devices we put in our homes for our children and how we interact with them, or the content we consume together. But let's now jump back to my story, because my story didn't just end in 2016. Let's talk about some modern Christery. Because I had been single up to that point, and even though I had gotten healthy and changed, I was still alone. So between 2016 and 2018, something amazing happened to me. Because by the time I was in my late 40s, I actually met someone. My story didn't end, and I had to look at my values differently. This time, I got married. And I can tell you one thing, if you have a family or recently got married or plan on getting married one day, your values radically get hit as you start to merge your values and your new extended family's values. So that meant I had to go back in and start looking at all the different ways, all the different places that my life and my spouse's life intersected. I couldn't just worry about what was important to me. I had to worry about what was important to we the two of us, and how we managed and thought about our lives together, but more importantly, how that impacted our friends and family. You see, my story just isn't one of how I use technology to make myself better. It was a story about how I use technology to actually shape my family, my community, and the world around me. And that's happening to each and every one of you today, too. After I mapped out my spouse's and my complete technological landscape, I started looking for the places where our values overlapped so we could start to understand how we can make better decisions. First thing I did was I created a new system, not tied to a Google Calendar, but tied to a database. Because if you've got two people, three people, four people, a lot of things in your life, a house, a home, more than one job, that's a lot to manage. In this database, I listed myself, my spouse, and all the different other people in our family. We actually have a very large pet population at our home because we love our dogs and cats. These entities were then aligned in my system to what we needed to make decisions about every single day, and that were our values. Now, we just didn't sit down and say, well, what are our values? We actually studied the word. We studied what it meant, and we studied about how values are created, how they're maintained, and when they shift. For us, making sure we had these values in our system was super important. Now, I don't normally do this in presentations, but what I'm gonna do right now is zoom right in and show you there's my family, my business, our pets and things, and actually the values in my value-based system. So if I go into my work value, this is for both me and my spouse, I can zoom in, you can read about how we manage, maintain the guardrails we do on our work value. But more importantly, we can look at all the different tasks associated with that work value, all the different documents, bills, etc. cetera. Uh, it's, it's quite robust. It can be a little bit overwhelming if you haven't seen it before, so I'll just let it go there. But I want you to understand that when we wrote down these values, it was about understanding what we wanted, 
because we didn't want to just measure how much money we made or how, what types of things we bought. We wanted to understand why we did them. Did we buy these things for our health? Did we spend this time on our home? Did we take that job because of our need to create service in the community? And this will make more sense in a little bit. From there, we wanted to look at how we designed our life. So once we had our values decided and we understood who we were as a family, we went and looked at all the different buckets our life fit into. The people we knew, the organizations we actually interacted with, the bills that came from living, the money we made, the goals we had, the uh, different applications or assets we bought, our journal entries, the email we got, the tasks we created. It had to be a way of seeing ourselves holistically but through the lens of what was important. So often in life, we, we don't know how to measure what we care about. So we care about what we measure. And I wanted to fix that problem. So I started this idea of life scripting. Once we had all these different ways to understand our life, we filtered them through our values. So when we were paying bills, the bills got assigned to a value. When I was taking on a new customer or a new project, I understood why. When our vets needed to go, when our pets needed to go to the vet, we had a value tied to that. Every single thing got categorized and understood through the lens of what was important to us. I never wanted to wonder when I woke up in the morning, why am I here? It was about measuring what we value. And that meant the statistics and the charts, graphs, and even dashboards we create were radically different. Again, here's some screenshots of those dashboards. But in reality, our family managed our lives from a dashboard. So we can come in here at any point, see the dates that are important to us, our values, who we are, uh, the different places we've been around the world, how our family is doing as far as our health, um, the, our bills by value, our tasks by value, our communication by value, our health, so when's the last time we saw the doctor, warranty, all this amazing information about our lives. And this allowed us to start to create more deeper meanings because now it wasn't just me and my spouse who were married and sharing our lives, we had time each week set aside where we'd actually have meetings like you would at work. We'd use stickies to decide where we were where we were aligned to our values that week and where we weren't and what we wanted to do better next week and how we could actually make a difference. It was remarkable. We even created a massive system to back up our love. And what that meant was we create these memories in the system where we log photos, videos, we each jot down memories. We have a website for our friends to go and put down memories. And all these memories get put into a system that we can see on a map or that syncs to our calendar. So not only us, but all of our friends, and even some of my customers can access their entire history about moments that were super special for us. And here in Texas, where we live, it's not always completely safe. We have a lot of climate issues, and right near our house, we've had massive issues over the last decade. And that meant when we bought our house, we had to consider things like disaster. For example, this was our house in 2017, but this was our house in 2018. Flooding because of climate change led to destruction and devastation to our neighborhood. So we had to think about when we bought this house, what types of systems would be impacted if there were something, again, value base. It wasn't just a home. It was a home on a fuel route. It was a home in a flood zone. It was a home that was prone to air pollution, electrical outages, and even water shortages. And that's in the United States. So again, turning to technology, whether it be the weather stations, cameras, or external sensors that were installed in and around our house to understand how we could be affected. Even our pets, Rocco, Sunny, Gaia, and, um, and Rocket, all had a way of being tracked and how do we do that? Not only for their health, but they all have real-time GPS. And I'll tell you right now, my cat loves to get around. So at any point we can find them. We took the Tesla we had from 2016 to 2020, turned it in, and we put a deposit down on a truck that acts as a whole home generator. But that's us. What about your today? What about all the things you're doing that could actually help you become better and more focused on living your values well, for you, I have three main lessons that you can do to start to think about this. Because I don't want you to become me. I don't want you to build these massive databases, although I think you could. I do want you to think about the things you could be doing to make sure that you express what you value through your technology instead of letting your technology dictate to you what you should value. Because autonomy is the most powerful thing we have in life. And whether we've got one device or thousands on us, how we choose to live 
what we do with that time is the most important thing that any of us can do. So lesson one, are you ready for this? Okay. Lesson one is you become the person you save. I think this is so important for each one of you to think about. Now, saving yourself can be as something as drastic as I did. Could it could also just be as remembering to put gas in the car before you go on a long trip. But when I mean, when I say saving yourself, what I mean by that is the ability to come in and look at your life in a way that allows you to reflect and set intentions and find meaning. So saving yourself can be as simple as creating a journal. It can be a paper journal. I've got paper journals all over my desk. I, mean, I love paper. I'm not that digital. People are like, you're so technical. I'm like, no, I use a lot of paper. Plus, you can burn paper. Um, <laughs> or it could be a little bit uh, less analog photos. We take a lot of photos. One of the things I encourage people to do all the time is create a share just take certain photos, photos of what you eat, photos of the people you meet. We actually keep a Polaroid camera by the front door and everyone who comes to visit us signs a guest book and we t take the Polaroid photo and put it in the guest book. Or something much more robust, keeping a diary, an online diary, an online journal. Something that allows you to look at your life regularly and learn from it. And, and this is so important because I think people don't realize what you're doing by not saving your life is allowing your life to be taken and reshaped by the systems you use. And for you, I want you to know that's probably not a, an outrageously hard thing, but it's something you need to do. For my family, the last project I did was I built a, an actual journaling system. You're seeing it on the screen now because I wanted my family to be able to come in any day and, and log where they were. So we have a morning. When you come in the morning, you come in here, log how you're feeling. This morning, I was feeling frustrated when I woke up. Um, and then put your mental health waiting, physical, spiritual. Do a little bit of reflection. Um, uh, you can do your afternoon reflections. Again, I do these three times a day. P pictures that you might have from your day you can embed right there and evening your your evening gratitude you can do so journaling can be something as simple as a note paper note pen and paper it can be photos it can be a journaling app or it can be something you just build yourself the quickest way to get started with this is actually an application i love called life cycle life cycle automatically saves where you go and you can assign it a category one of the fastest ways to do this is create categories for your values and if you're going to the grocery store Make it the, the, the value for health, if that's, if that's why you go to the grocery store. The second thing I wanted to teach you in the three steps to getting more out of your life and this techno value is make your work life your life's work. Think about that. So many of us don't want to work. We want to retire. But wouldn't it be more satisfying to just make your life's work, the thing you're remembered for, your work life? And there are some ways you can do that. But I think the fastest way to do that is something that you're going to start hearing more about in this decade, just like we heard about mobile technology in 2012, here 10 years later. It's about this concept of no code. No code is just a really fancy way of saying there are tools now that allow you to stitch together the important things in your life. No code might be able to create a database of different people that you know at your church or community to help them meet each other. There are so many no-code tools out there, everything from business intelligence to machine learning, but the one thing they all have in common, if you can use a spreadsheet, if you can use a word processor, you can build an application. Seriously, any of you can build an application today. I did three no-code tools over the pandemic that I'm so proud of. The first one was a corona response system that stitched together my neighborhood with volunteers donating their time and their skills. The second one in 2021 was a financial tracker that helped people who were going through financial crisis because of the downturn in the economy. And the third one was based on helping black speakers get found and paid in 2022 because I thought it was so important that we need more people represented at conferences. These systems allow me to take what I do from day to day and actually channel what I want to be doing in the things that might not be as financially lucrative as they want now, but they express who I am. How can you start? Try out one of my favorite tools, Airtable. Much like Lifecycle, it's super simple. It's free to use. 
You can even go and download two of the apps I just showed you at the Airtable Universe today. If you can build a spreadsheet, you can build an application that could possibly change not only your neighborhood or your work, but your entire community. And the last thing I want to talk to you about in the three ways that you can embrace techno valueism is you become the three apps you use the most. My mother used to say to me all the time growing up, she was a heavy smoker. So excuse my voice for a moment. Christopher, Christopher, listen, you need better friends. You're, you're just the three people you hang out with. And I'll be honest with you, it's hard to do that voice, so excuse me why I take a sip. I don't know. What's well, probably why she drank so much coffee. But I'll be honest with you, you do. You become the three applications you use the most. So if you're constant email, you're probably all about work. If you're constantly in your running application, you're probably all about health. So to start to get your head around that, you have to think about, well, how do I get over that? How do I start to examine what I value by these three applications? Now, I'll be honest with you, the tech companies don't make this easy. To find this out, you have to actually go into your battery settings on iPhone and Android. And in your battery settings, you'll be able to see the different applications you use and how often you use them. I encourage you to do this at dinner with your spouse and your kids because you'll be shocked at how much we're in these different apps. But the fastest way to get started with this today for yourself, if you want to take it a little bit more serious, is an application called Rescue Time, which allows you to look at all the different applications you use when you're on your different computers and manage and, and monitor them so that you understand the types of things you value because you've got to be careful of those applications. See, it's time we start, it's time we stop valuing our tools and we start tooling our values. And that's really what I mean by techno valueism. It's about returning autonomy to you to decide what's important and how it not only shapes the world around you, but shapes you. To do this, in the next part of the presentation, which is going to be live, I'm actually gonna do phone palmistry. But what is phone palmistry? Phone palmistry is actually something I've been doing for nearly a decade all over the world. I actually have a booth we ship to conferences, uh, big companies we send the booth to, and I read people's phones. They literally hand me their phone, unlock it. I don't open any apps, but I look at their home screen and I tell them just based on their home screen, the types of things that are important to them and what type of person they are. Almost like a therapist for your phone without actually getting too personal. I'm excited to show you that live. But here's a really good example. Here's someone who shared their phone with me over the internet, and you can do that too. We set up a site for the Group M. Um, and I went in there and I looked at this carefully, and my decisions was, well, this is someone whose career is on the bleeding edge. They're deeply spiritual. Um, they're, they're basically convicted creating more space in their life, and they don't let information overwhelm them. How did I figure that out? Well these things they have a mountain wallpaper so they're actually thinking about climbing and ascending uh this idea that their camera app is far away from them so they've got this kind of watchful eye it's a lot of fun and i can't wait to do it for you but that's all the time i have for this presentation so let's get to reading some phones before we do though i have four things for every single one of you to take if you scan a copy of this or see the organizers you'll get a copy of this presentation every single one of you can get a sample copy of my book at that qr code I built an entire website called The Habit Store where you can browse some of my favorite apps that I use to focus on my own techno valueism. And then finally, that's my information, my phone number, my email. People say, do you really put your phone number on the internet? And I say, absolutely, because it's something I value, service and helping other people. And with that, I wanna thank you all and let's get to the phone reading. Are you ready? I want to learn all about you. <laughs> Talk to you in a second.